All right, guys, welcome to My Muscle Connection. I believe this is episode 34. We are more than honored to have a special guest with us today. Turned pro in 1984, competed in Mr. Olympia seven times. Um, three of those were runner up, and um, all of them were top 10 finishes. I think six of them were top five finishes. He also won the very first Arnold Classic in 1989 and was inducted into the IFBB Hall of Fame in 2004. He is uh, he started Gaspari Nutrition in 1998, which now be going 23 years strong. If everybody please welcome Rich Gasperi on the show for us. Rich, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Dude. This is a really big deal. Thank you. Um, I've been I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And uh, I just thanks for coming on and joining us. So no, it's like, great to be on the show. Yeah, I would um I want to start by talking about Gasperi Nutrition, how you got it started. Because, you know, with, I'm sure you've heard this a lot, the, the market's saturated with supplement companies, especially early 2000s, they all started coming out. What was your, when you decided to go to the supplement company, what was your vision? What was the, the, the like the mission statement? What was the inspiration? What were you trying to do that was going to put you above the other companies when you came out? Well, if, if you know my history in bodybuilding, you know that, um, I, a lot of my success, I, I, I feel, was based on nu nu nutrition, you know, learning things about, you know, the human body, you know, and I was always looking for an edge, you know, in supplementation. But when I was competing, it was very, uh, very basic. You know, there wasn't a lot of stuff out there. I think it, creatine just came out. Um, there were some branch chains and stuff, but it was it was very, very basic. And uh I wanted to just come up with products, you know, because I was a, I was a competitive athlete and I want to come up with the best products. And it was in the market was very confusing with the products. So I wanted to do it myself. And by, and, and it was by accident almost because I don't know if you know, like I retired because I had a serious injury. I, I ruptured a disc in my neck that basically retired me while I was laying in bed. I sat there and said, well, I can't use my body to make money anymore. So I'm going to come up with this supplement line. You know, everyone, always doubted me in becoming one of the best bodybuilders in the world. And when I started Gaspar Nutrition, it was the same thing. I said, I'm going to start a supplement company. If those guys can do it, so can I. So I just, while I was in bed, you know, rehabbing from the injury, I was, you know, studying, you know, products that I wanted to come out with. And I started looking into manufacturing and, you know, just the basis of coming up with a, with a supplement line. Now, when, from what I've understood, well, I'll say like this: there, um, when somebody thinks of a of a pro bodybuilder coming out with a supplement line, usually they're going to think, "Oh, you know, he'll come out, put his name on it, throw some money into it, it'll take off, it'll be pretty smooth sailing." From what I understand, that wasn't the case with you. I've heard no. I, I've heard stories that like you you started with a loan, you were selling stuff out of your car, out of your garage, trying to get the company started. I think um, I think it would be good to tell people how how you got it started, so they can see how long you've come to bring Gasparri Nutrition to where it is today. Well, like you said, I, I, I started my product line with just a little bit of the money that I got from, you know, competing as a pro bodybuilder. I mean, we made money as a pro, um, but I went through a very just I went through a divorce and, you know, I had lost money. And what I basically did was sell everything and uh, move back into my parents house to start Gasparri Nutrition. So, you know, I was driving around a 911 Porsche. I sold it bought myself a minivan, lettered it up with Gasparri Nutrition that I was going to go visit all these accounts. Um, you know, so I felt I had to go backwards before I went forwards. And it's hard for a lot of people because if you're used to a certain lifestyle, you know, I was getting wine and dine as a pro bodybuilder. And now I was basically going to take myself and start a company. And then I had to go out there and sell myself with the supplement line. You know, and at first it wasn't that easy because I said, well, I'm training in all these gyms in New Jersey, New York. I just go to those places. They all love me. But you know what? I was surprised to find out that a lot of guys were not interested in buying the products. You know, they were interested when I was on top of the world as a pro bodybuilder, but not as much, you know, for trying to help me out and getting the product line. So I just did a lot of door knocking, you know, going from place to place to place. You were right. I'm getting a loan from my brother. What what I did is I started, you know, getting involved in the sport by judging. One of the shows I judged um, was a show, show in Virginia. And the owner of Europa, Eric Hillman, was there. And I was trying to get into the district, you know, get into his distribution. And he was like, really, you know, I know your name, but I haven't heard of your line. 
you know, we haven't seen any demand for your product line in, uh, you know, they they were based out of Charlotte. This is what before Europe became uh, Europa became big. Mm-hmm. So I thought to myself, I said, I'm going to get this product line big. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start calling all the stores in Charlotte to get them. To basically, what I did is I called specific stores and I said, Hey, do you carry Gaspar Nutrition? Hey, do you carry Gaspar Nutrition? So all these stores, I got them to basically, you know, in, in different voices to try to you know get them to say like there's a demand. For this brand, Despire Nutrition, that I would call the stores. I would call the stores and say, "Hey, I, this is uh, Rich Gasparri." That's brilliant. And he goes, "Oh, by the way, I just got some calls about your brand. Let's yeah, let me carry some of the stuff." So I, what I did is I I put it in all the stores near the Charlotte area. That you know, basically, Eric Hillman then notices like, "Oh, your product is in you know places here in Charlotte. You know, maybe we're going to take on the line." So they took on the line, but it was it was a big amount of money back then. It was it was like about fifty thousand dollar PO. So I had to just borrow money from my brother to you know to be able to make the product, you know, to pay for the PO that I knew was going to get paid for, you know, in thirty days. So and that's kind of what I did. I you know I always thought outside the box to you know to move forward in you know building my company. I never. I never believed in having people say, you know, no to me. I always went back and I was very persistent, you know, and I guess that's part of my persistence in, you know, as a bodybuilder, you know, say I, I didn't have the genetics to be, you know, one of the best bodybuilders, but I, you know, got all the way up to second place three years in a row, won the Arnold Classic, won the pro world. And as you said, seven years in the Olympia, you know, one of the top 10 competitors and six of them top five. So. I, I use the same tenacity and attitude in competing towards my company. And I feel all of us, the, you know, what a lot of athletes don't know how to do is to take that same drive that they use in sports and use it towards other endeavors or companies. And, and that's something I did, you know, in building up Gaspari Nutrition. And Speaking we talk of- about this on our show uh, rather often is, is that, you know, I always talk about the chase or the goal, you know, the, I say the chase always heals when you're not chasing something or, you know, Rich, you're a great example of this. Once something ended for you and you're like, okay, this is over. You immediately found your next chase and started going after that with the same drive and same passion. And, you know, looks where it led you. And you're right. A lot of athletes, once bodybuilding is over, it's going to be over for all of us at some point. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, at some point, whatever you're doing is going to end. It's time. That's when it's time to move on to the next thing. Now, Rich, you're also remembered out. Now, I've been taking super pumps since 2002. All right. I literally, I'm sitting here. I just took two scoops of it. You know, <laughs> you know I, I always love, always love Max. Max is always my favorite. It lasts, it lasts throughout the day. I, I take aggression, taking all of it. But I was taking, I remember 2002 when it first came out. I would actually, I was hiding it in my uh, drawer um because my my mom didn't want me to take supplements so i used to yeah. go to the gnc and i would take super pump 250 uh which was the original and that yeah. went off the market i was just curious what happened with the original like 250 like you're you're by the way you're known like you can't talk about pre-workout <laughs> without thinking about conspired nutrition like it is you invented pre-workout you know i i wasn't the very first but i was probably one of the first to market with the pre-workout category you, you know back yeah. then there was there was really no companies with it. There was another company called BSN, which we know with NO Explode. Yeah. Um, I was your rival. Yep. <clears throat> that was my rival. And it was funny. I, they came out about the same time. Mm-hmm. You know, they were the red cans. I was the blue cans. Yep. When I came up with that product, it was it was actually a product that was offered to um, Metrex. And they didn't take the product on. And I saw the formula. I said, shit, this is a pretty cool formula. Let me Let me sell it. And we came up with the super pump 250. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, at first it wasn't like the most easiest thing, you know, back then the pro the product uh, taste wasn't that great. It, um, it had a kind of a nasty taste, yeah, but it was, it, it, did, it definitely worked. And it was a, a work in progress today. It's a much different market, but uh, I was able to grow this, you know, grow that product and was very competitive. You know, like I said, Anno explode was, my rival and you know it's funny they were they were promoting their brand and, and we were growing super pump 250 and at that time they had walls of red we had waves of blue and what would i do is i say okay to the stores we buy out their red bottles and say you know waves break walls 
and we take over their property. <laughs> and the owner of BSN hated me um, because, I, like I said, I, I used to competitive in this. I used in bodybuilding and business. And we were, you know, it was a it was a one two brand. It was you know, exploding Aspire Nutrition Super Pump two fifty were the leading pre workouts. And it, it, as you said, we we were one of the first. And now you see, there's thousands of pre workouts that are out there on the market today. A lot, a lot of come and gone, man. But you know, at the end of the day, Super Pump has lasted the test of time. I mean, we're talking. I mean, look at Jack three D was like the biggest thing, right? For a while, then boom, Jack three D is gone. Super Pump came. Now Super Pump three came out April 4th, 2014. Now, why do I remember that exact day? I'm not some lunatic. That you're, was the you're, same- you're, I don't even remember these dates, but you're really good at doing this. <laughs> no, let me explain why. That was the same week that the Ultimate Warrior passed away. Remember, wow. remember right? I'm yeah. like, all right, is there some correlation between the new Super Pump and the Ultimate Warrior passing and away? Actually, <laughs> no, I was friends with him. You know, it's funny. I was actually in his uh, documentary about, you know, about him when he first moved to- uh, California. I was there moving, you know, I was there at the same time with him and we were friends. He was trying to be a pro bodybuilder. He didn't make it as a pro bodybuilder. He ended up being, you know, a famous wrestler. But uh, I, that was just a coincidence, that date with the 3.0. You asked me, why did we change the formulas? We were really big in GNC. And what would happen is GNC would basically force me, you know, the sales are dropping. We need to do something different. Let's change the formula. Let's give it a different name. And that's how it ended up always changing because, you know, sometimes when it's not broken, don't fix it. But because I had a chain of, you know, thousands of stores telling me to like, Hey, can we do something different? Let's come up with a different one. Let's come up with max. Let's come up with, you know, 3.0. And that's how the progression of that product kept changing. And it's funny. We did the 3.0. And as you can see, you're using max. That was one of the second iterations yes. of, of the, uh, of the brand that's still around. Even though right now, because of the high stim market, we came up with what you said, super pump aggression. That's a very, very strong, you know, stimulant product, nootropic, and, and that's doing very well as well. So we have the old school bodybuilders that like the max. And then we have the new school, as you see with the, uh, the look of the bottle with the, you know, a graffiti that we changed to, to kind of make it like the bad boy, the brand. Yeah. <laughs> got, got them both right here. Uh, just, you know, for people, for all the people listening, super pump max, great, especially if you're new into the pre-workout realm, you know, it's a great starter. Just not, it'll keep you going throughout the day for the hardcore guys. This is it right here. The Hooper zine in this year, it gives you such great focus. It's, it's yeah. almost unparalleled. So, you know, I go, I'll do four, Four weeks to do a month of this and i'll do two months of this and i find that to be a good balance i've been taking this like i said for 20 years you know what i mean wow. my blood works great i'm perfectly healthy so you know i'm part yeah. of team disparity and i you know i'll back i'll back aspire to the i end. remember when that's dominic my, that's the end of my super pump rant right there i remember when dominic introduced super pump to me he's like this shit brother this is an infinity stone right In here <laughs> when i was on a yeah, search and rescue mission um uh, i'm a search and rescue swimmer in the navy and we had to go out at two in the morning and we got to be ready to go in like 15 minutes like no bullshit you are waking up and in the middle of the ocean within 15 minutes so i was able to run i ran to my locker and i was drinking i used to keep super pump there because you know you could be out for a while so i would drink super pump and then boom i'm in the middle of the ocean looking for you know rescue people so while the boat was getting ready to uh to head out i would drink a super pump the commanding officer comes down he's like he goes what are you doing? And that's where I invented my catchphrase. I go, I'm uh, getting pumped to the max, sir. And he goes, all right. And he, <laughs> he didn't know what I meant, but I, that's why I kept, made my catchphrase pumped to the max. I'm never drink super pump. So, all right, I'm, I'm done um, talking about my super pump. I want to, I actually like, uh, was looking into the, the creation of super pump. And I remember when the pre-workouts came out, cause I was in the gym and trying to look for the next products and stuff. And the way I understood it was at first MRI came out with the, with the nitric oxide stuff, the NO2 pills. And it was, um, it was one of the first pump products ever to come out. And then BSN came out with NO Explode. And then Rich, you came out with a product that it was a pre-workout, but it started hitting performance at multiple angles instead of just going for pump or stem. Like you went talking about um, counteracting like the, the stress put on the body and stuff like you were putting different stuff in the product that was, that was trying to increase the human performance from multiple angles is what made super pump different from the other ones. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we added branch chains to the product for recovery and repair. 
you know, it had the it, it had the vasodilation ingredients for pump with citrulline. Um, it had creatine in it. I mean, it was a product that had all angles when it came to a, a pre-workout. You had the you had the the stimulant, cre- you know, caffeine in there. Um, you know, when people like think about Super Pump 250, I, a lot of people say, well, you know, you need to come out back, you know, back out with that product. And I and I go, you know, that was the first pre-workout. There was nothing like it out there at the time. And, you know, I was I always have an analogy of like the Model T was the first car, you know, that was out there. I said, would you drive a Model T today? You're not going to drive it because it's way, you know, it's not to today's standards. And, you know, coming up with Super Rump 250 today would not be as good as what's in the new pre-workouts today. You know, right. there's revolution of what are, what is out there. And that's why we came up with aggression and why we came up with Max and products like that, because you're constantly want to improve. Um you know, formulations for people. Now, um, before I get to this next question, I want people to understand, <coughs> Rich, Rich, how you talked about, you know, people not telling you no and, and being a bodybuilder and doing so well. You know, this was before the, the 202, the 212 categories came out. And you like, I know you're, you're considered one of the s- smaller guys. Like I know in 1988, you compete at two, 209 and a half pounds to finish second. So, I mean, this was back. I, what was the average competing weight? Like 230 back then? I, I did I did go up as high as 220, 221. I, I was in the uh, 87 Olympia. Then they told me I was getting too thick. So yeah. I dropped down. And when I was 209, I was on stage around 212. So I would have yeah. been in the 212 category. But a lot of the guys weren't that big. I mean, you know, uh, Lee Haney was about 240, okay. you know, when he you know was winning the Olympia. So he wasn't as big as they are to today's standards, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to like say, you know, we were better. It was a different era. I mean, guys from our era, I think, you know, I brought in the whole, you know, striations, the first guy with spray glutes and, and that, you know, came afterwards into the nineties. I I think the peak in bodybuilding was basically the mid to late nineties into 2000. It was probably to me, the the peak, the peak bodybuilding because you had a Ronnie Coleman, that straight glutes that weighed, you know, 270, 280 pounds. Yeah. I think at his best when he got to 300, I think he got too heavy, but, um, that's, that, that's kind of my opinion on, you know, on that. But that eighties, I think the transition, I think the conditioning was starting to take a turn at that point. But I think the eighties is really when you start seeing people come in really conditioned. Yeah. I got Gary Stridum, um, you Lee Haney, these guys, um, it was it was different from what you saw in the seventies as far as conditioning. So yeah. I do I do like to study the nutrition aspects and stuff of those guys because I know there was less stuff to to substitute back then. So you really had yeah. to get down to the basic knowledge of how food worked and stuff. So I like studying those guys a lot when it comes to nutrition, how they got so lean. Um, but before I get switch into that, I got another question about the Gasparian Nutrition Company because usually when people start getting successful, and they hit a high. Um, it, it's it, they it's hard for them to bounce back if something bad happens, you know, like, or if they get knocked down or if they hit another slump because, you know, they've been doing well, all of a sudden, sudden something happens. And some people could argue that it's even harder to bounce back from something like that. Now, from my understanding, there was a point where Gasperi kind of wanted the demand for products went down and you had to, you had to um, either go into partnership or do something to, to kind of get the company going again. Um, I think if you wouldn't mind going into more detail about what happened. With well, it, it, what happened, um, it's a little bit more detailed than that. I, I, I went into a, a horrible uh, divorce. And at the time, I, I you know, Gasparri, we went into bankruptcy, business bankruptcy. So it, it was it was a death by a thousand cuts. I had lawsuits into the company. I had going through divorce. I had, um, you know, like hostile employees into the company, stealing. It was just a lot of stuff at once. And, but because my personal life was, was messed up, I could have dealt with all the business stuff. But when, you're, when your own personal life is messed up, I, I, I took my eye off the ball. And the company, unfortunately, went into a spiral. At that time, even though we went into, that, into business bankruptcy, the company still had a value of over, it was, it was still a high amount of value. We did over $60 million and we were still... I still got, we sold for like in bankruptcy, we sold over 20 million. So the partnership that I took on was not by choice, it was something I had to do. 
And when you talk about learning about business, you know, I, I, I have the school of hard knocks. I was able to learn about, you know, business bankruptcy where you stand in an auction and people are your business being auctioned off because you owe debt. And it's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible thing. And I was able to um, bounce back from that because I had to take my own personal money to buy back into the company. And I became a minority shareholder and then slowly get rid of the partners and then get my company back, which took a total of seven years that right now I'm back with the company totally. And what I didn't want to do is give up my name. My name was everything to me. And I I could have walked away and maybe started another company because I had had personal assets, you know, my own money. The company was another thing and I could have started another company, but I didn't do it that way. I, I did it the hard way. I said, I can't give up my name. And I went through three partners to finally get my company back. And, you know, and now as you see all the products that are out there in the last couple of years, these are all the iterations of myself. We're growing back. It's it's like the renaissance of Gaspari that we're back. And, you know, people are noticing me again from the pandemic. You know, I actually was a good thing for me because a lot of people in pandemic, you know, like hid under their, you know, beds, you know, so, so to speak, because they didn't know what to do. You know, I was there sitting, you know what, I'm going to come up with more products. I'm going to focus on online sales. I'm going to grow this business, learn about target marketing, learn about web, you know, web sales, and I'm able to reinvent the entire company in the last two years. And I mean, we're going through a Black Friday sale and it's, it's the biggest sale we've had, you know, with direct to consumer and the company is, you know, if you could see a lot of the noise we're making, the company is back and, and you know, we have an affiliate program with, you know, thousand athletes. We continue to grow uh, so many ways and you just have to reinvent yourself. And, you know, you, it is true. You know, I went back where I was a hundred million dollar company and then basically lost it and now building it back up. And I just never gave up hope. Um, I'm a person that never gives up. You know, it's my strength and my weakness because, you know, I never give up on business, but sometimes you have to give up on people because people don't have the same philosophy as you do. But, you know, it's it's where I am today. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that, you know, I'm an older, wiser Rich Gaspari. I'm not the athlete that I was, but I'm still a very experienced businessman from everything that I've been through. So speaking of like not Fox. giving up, this is why I like Rocky Five. Rocky Four, he beats the Russian top of the world. Rocky Five, he's in the gutter, broke. And he said, you know what? I can get the fuck out of this. And he worked his way up. And you got Rocky Balboa. You got Creed. And now you got the new Rocky Four out. I mean, hey, he, hey you know what I mean? Like, it's that. this is the type of shit what I love to hear. You know what I mean? This is why we, I love our podcast. Because this is, you know, these are the stories that are going to help other athletes and help motivate other people. Not just in bodybuilding, but in necessarily in life. You're going to get knocked down fucking crushed. And shit happens at this lowest level and even at the, the highest elite level. It happens to everybody. That's the message that we're always pushing. You'll be on top one day. Next day, boom, flat yeah. on your face. You got to get the fuck back up. Right? You know, the, the difference now is, you know, I, I didn't. I never went broke, but I was, you know, I, I was I was down a lot of levels to where I was. Right, right, you know? right. Oh, and. But the one thing I had, and I said, you know, you could take everything away from me, but I still have all the knowledge up here. I have all the contacts and the business experience that I can bounce right back. And, you know, a lot of businesses, like like I said, from this pandemic, we're still trying to follow old models of business, you know, where, you know, you go to trade shows and you're in magazines and magazines are dead now. <laughs> you have to re, you have to basically reinvent yourself and what you're what you're going to do. And. And that's what I did. You know, I started listening to younger, you know, people that are doing, you know, the business like I am now with this online direct to consumer model. The noise we make from a direct to consumer model is transcended into the retail market that now we're growing and into the international market that we're growing and the company continues to grow. Yeah. I I want to take a turn here and ask you something a little different. There's an affirmation that you believed in back in the 80s. I think it goes like this. I think it's, I believe in Gaspari. I can do better than Gaspari. What went into producing that affirmation? 
and what fueled it throughout your career? Like what actually drove you? How did it start? I, I don't know if it's just something I'm born with, you know, to have this inner drive to push myself to the limit. You know, when I was 13 years old, I said, I'm going to be a pro bodybuilder. I knew right away I was going to be a pro bodybuilder. You know, with people telling me you couldn't do it. I moved to California, you know, and I won the nationals at, you know, 188 um, after winning the junior nationals. And I was told that I would never become a pro, a good pro. I, I was, I would, I'd win the universe, the nationals in the universe turn pro. And that was it for me. And I just never listened to, you know, people. And it was something that was just an inner drive. And I believe there are people out there that have this inner drive that push themselves. You know, you see very successful people like Elon Musk that failed many times. And mm -hmm. it, it, you just have to have it in you. I, I don't, I don't think it's something that's taught. Is something that's in you and you know i continue feeling that you know i am i am older um but i still have that drive to continue pushing myself you know to build you know other other businesses and you know and for me it's cool to reinvent myself and to and this just to get to another level and, and see the success you know the fruits of your labor you sit there and you sometimes you work and work and work and this is what a lot of people don't understand you know the mind of an entrepreneur is you can work your ass off and not get anywhere for a while. And right. then finally it starts to get momentum, but there are a lot of people that they just don't know how to handle that. And after, you know, you know, a year of, you know, grinding mm -hmm. and they don't see results, they give up. Yeah. And that's, and that's a lot of people. It's, it's a very hard, you have to have a certain mindset to be an entrepreneur. And I'm, you know, I, I never understood the word entrepreneur, but you know, I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely, you know, I am an entrepreneur. That's what I am. I, you know, before bodybuilding, you know, I was an entrepreneur, you know, as a bodybuilder, I, you know, was the first bodybuilder to, um, you know, when Joe Weider asked me, he goes, would you like to get paid or would you want to have ads in my magazine? I took the ads in the magazine because I was, I was able to sell booklets. I was able to sell my shirts. You know, I was the first bodybuilder to come up with multiple videos you know, the video, they were just coming out videos back then. And that those were the VCR back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> the really other guys was. were coming up with one video. And I'm like thinking about it. Well, if I come up with one video, I'm only going to sell one. So I'm going to break the body parts into three videos. So you have to buy the three videos. So I would make <laughs> more money because I was selling three videos when other guys were selling one video. So I always had an entrepreneurial mindset in what, you know, whatever I did. So from being that bodybuilder to starting Gaspari, you, I, I just have that type of mindset. That's amazing. I think, uh, well, I, I think that you're one of the few bodybuilders out there that actually inspired me because, you know, I, I just recently got into the craft. You know, I'm close to 40 and um, I know it's a little late in the game, but it's never too late, right? I have this tendency to be a mad scientist about my body and see how far I can push myself. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is for someone older that's just starting out like myself, with very little knowledge of the craft, what would be some of the challenges that you would think that a person like me would have getting to getting getting on stage, getting to a competition, performing, just based off of your experience performing and watching other people perform? I mean, when you're older, you don't recover as quickly. I mean, that's one thing you have to look at it, you know, look at. I mean, when you're older, you are a little bit, you know, wiser. When you're older, a lot of times you're more established. You may have a family and it's much harder to just focus on bodybuilding. Right. So, I mean, those are the challenges that you have when, you know, when you are more mature, or more older, you know, when I was 20, you know, I, I turned pro, I was 20 years old. I didn't give a crap about anything. I didn't mm. have a family. I didn't have anything. I, I could live in a shoebox, and it didn't matter as long as I could train and, you know, eat the food six times a day. You know, I had one thing in my mind, and that was to be a pro bodybuilder. When you're in your 40s, you, you have, you know, you, you, you have a job, you're, right. you may have a family. And then, you know, it, like I just told you, it's not like recuperation, repair. You have to look at that at your training and just be a little bit more cognizant of, of how you're going to train so that you can, you know, recover when you are competing. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for answering that. <laughs> I um, I know you were one of the first to come in, like 
with really good conditioning. Um, I was watching, I don't know if you remember, I was watching Battle for Gold. I've actually watched it quite a few times. Oh, I, I saw there. that. I yeah. Love that. And um, when you start talking about some of the things with nutrition, um, I wanted to ask you, because I like studying the nutrition aspect a lot, me being a trainer and I'm always trying to, I actually like looking into more of the training and dieting aspect rather than more of the enhancement aspect. Cause I think that's the foundation of a lot of, I think people are today are, are forgetting that. And uh, there's a lot of preventive medicine. There's a lot of, a lot of good things you come out of when you study nutrition. Um, and I noticed in that video, you were, you studied it a lot. You were really knowledgeable in it for somebody wanting to get that same kind of knowledge. So where would be the first place to look or what books would you recommend? Like, where did you get started learning all that stuff? I can't even remember the name, the name of the books that I, that I bought, but you know, it, it's, I believe it's much easier today, you know, having Google, you know, an online, you know, learning from so many different experts out there. The thing is, is there's so much information online that it actually becomes difficult because there's a lot of crap besides, yeah. you know, good information. And what I did is I, you know, experiments with my body, you got to remember, you know, I came into the late eighties into the nineties and, and in the seventies, bodybuilders were following just very low carb diets, you know, before a show, they would just eat fats and proteins, took out their carbs and that's how they would diet. Now I did that diet at first and I'm like, this diet makes me feel like crap. I can't follow this diet. And then I read about a, a, a guy named Barry Sears you know, basically it was a diet of 40, 40, 20. I, I followed more of a diet of a balanced diet of, you know, 40% protein, 40% carbs and 20% fat. And that worked best for me. You know, I never carb depleted. I came in, you know, known as one of the most shredded bodybuilders and everyone goes, oh, you must eat no carbs at all. No, I ate a lot of carbs when I dieted for a show. My metabolism was, was, was faster. You know, I take, I took in good fats and I was taking in, you know, fish, salmon, um, olive oil. I was making sure that I followed that 40, 40, 20 rule. When I got closer to a show, you know, I would lower my caloric intake to get myself to get leaner and leaner and leaner. When I got closer to the show, I always told people I was ready two weeks out from a show. When I was ready two weeks out from the show, what would I basically do is I would stop doing cardio I would decrease the intensity of my training. And what would happen? My body would start slowly filling up with glycogen. And I would get myself from that two week mark to the day of the show, putting on me sometimes, you know, three, four pounds just of glycogen and, and getting myself to look a lot tighter and fuller. I really didn't do any type of, you know, carb loading the last couple of days. I didn't need as much protein. So I cut my proteins and I would eat complex carbs, you know, into the show. And then the day before, sometimes I experiment with simple carbs, you know, I'd eat, you know, you know, even stuff like, you know, crap, you know, I'd eat, you know, say donuts or, you know, they had fats and sugars before a show because my body was so ripped that taking in something like that didn't really hurt me, you know, when I, when I got into the show. So a lot of it, you know, when you saw that video and go for the gold, I was experimenting with, with my body with carbohydrates, you know, back then it's like a carb is a carb. And I'm like, no, I, I, I see a difference if I'm eating pasta, white bread, um, and, or any white flour products. And I ate a certain amount of carbs with my protein. Then I cut out gluten and I was eating like sweet potatoes, rice, oatmeal. I saw the difference that my body wasn't holding water. So then I started reading about it and I found out about, you know, people that had gluten sensitivities. And I said, it was gluten. I said, even though I don't have a gluten issue, I did notice that when someone was ingesting gluten, that they would hold water. So you never see a bodybuilder dieting on bread, you know, or, yeah. or, you know, or, or pasta, you know, actually I was eating a gluten-free pasta. Yeah. I, was I remember. Oh, it was like so, artichoke, artichoke, noodles artichoke, artichoke pasta. Yeah. I think it was artichoke Nepal's pasta. Artichoke. Yeah. So you use your, it, use it your would, mom's marinara sauce or is it, or is it, or is it, or is it gravy? <laughs> no, I would use my own. I, you know, if you saw me like when I was dieting, I mean, there was, you know, there's a lot of, you know, pork in there. And I, I didn't really like that. I, 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 like I said, I was very strict with dieting. Food was a means to a source. It wasn't an enjoyment for me. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, eating was just a way to get myself to look a certain way then, you know, and that's, that's what I did.
Yeah, uh, that's fun. The, I was reading um, the anabolic primer. They have some sections of what you guys would do when you get to a contest. And that's pretty much, I was going to ask, because sometimes stuff comes out in magazines and it gets tweaked a little bit. But what you said is almost exactly what that book said you did. And it looked like you took you took a path of more recovering into the contest and most people would just push harder. Yes. So, and um, while, and, while and I was it, reading, you would, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I just, go ahead. I mean, it, it just, I seen guys going to shows when I went into the Olympia, I never had a gaunt face. I actually, my face was a little fuller. So people thought I wasn't in shape. And then when I got on stage, they're like, Holy crap, he's shredded. You know? So <laughs> that whole thing of going into a show where you're emaciated, you shouldn't go in and do a show like that. You should be able to get the most glycogen into the muscle when you're on stage, because you see guys that end up pigging out, um, after a show and they look better two days after the show because yeah. they're, they over dieted. They always over diet. Yeah. And, um, I, there was one part where it said you cut it out, but then like, like you said, you would actually cut your protein down to get more carbs in yes. towards the contest. Yeah. I was, I read that. I was like, man, that's crazy. Cause I wanted to ask you about it. Cause that, I mean, to me, it makes sense, but at the same time, you don't see a lot of people doing it. I think it's cause they're, they're afraid to, you know, cause yeah. I just want to keep pushing harder. But. I was always in shape off season so I can experiment off season to see the effect of what diet did to me. And, and, and I was, I was very like a guy who had everything down that I would write, you know, in a book I had, I have tons and tons of journals, unfortunately to get into like, you know, with my company, when I started my company, I started out my mom's basement in the house and two years into the business, my mom's house burned down. I lost all my product. Oh. I lost all the um, memorabilia of me from competing. I also oh. lost all those journals that I had because today I feel I should I, I could sell those journals that I, that I did. Oh yeah. For, oh, know, totally. for, you know. Because uh, you said like the way way you said was all nutrition based. Like you said you weren't big on diuretics or any of that stuff. You just manipulated no. how you took in the food and you were what you came in the first guy was shredded glutes. You were insanely shredded. At a decent weight, I mean, it's it makes sense. Yeah, that was there's a lot of good knowledge I bet in those. That that's um that's what always that's what always uh, caught my attention when I watch anything come across any of the content videos or anything <laughs> about was that your knowledge on nutrition. So I definitely wanted to ask you. I appreciate you answering that for me. Yeah, I know this may sound like a rhetorical and obvious question, but just to help you know aspiring bodybuilders out there. How significant of a role do you think mental toughness plays in handling a career like bodybuilding? Like what are some of your methods for crushing limiting beliefs that come up? I mean, I, I do believe you have to have it in you. You do have to have mental toughness. I mean, any guy who goes in their underwear on stage with people assessing them <laughs> have, have some type of mental toughness and, get, sure. critiqued, and get critiqued and how they look. Um, Again, it's 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 something that when you're competing, and I've talked to other champion bodybuilders, you know, Jay Cutler and Ronnie Coleman, and you have such a driven blinder attitude when you're competing. When I was competing, I had blinders. I didn't care about anything besides my competitive career, you know, and being the best. And nothing else mattered to me. I mean, you know, family functions, girlfriends. I mean, I didn't care. I didn't care about anything except the next show that I was competing, how was I going to improve and what I was going to do. You know, and I talked to other colleagues like bodybuilders like Jake Cutler and it's the same thing. After you're done com competing, then you're like, wow, there's a whole other world out there <laughs> because all you're doing is, you know, training for a show. The mental toughness is just the focus and the drive that you either have it or don't that makes you a champion. And the guys that, are great are the ones that have it. The ones that I've spoken to, you know, I have a podcast, you know, fitness, fame, and fortune, and every champion that I've talked to has that in them to have that blinder attitude, focus to be the best that they can be. And we'll do everything to do, you know, to be the best. Right. Yeah. And all that. Really and, and you took that from bodybuilding and applied it to the business aspect that have become just successful. I've noticed that with a lot, even with back with Schwarzenegger, when he became an actor, he took what he learned from bodybuilding and acting and look where he became the highest paid actor in Hollywood as a freaking action star. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, 
that's something to say. And I've noticed with uh, even Jay Cutler, he's got his own brand out and he's, he's still known even after he hasn't competed in so long. So I think, I think it's one message. A lot of people don't look at this and see as being jocks or, or being, you know, hard headed or whatever. But they don't realize that the stuff you learn trying to get ready for a contest or trying to diet and, and, and defeating the outside world, because the outside world is a huge challenge when you're trying to get ready for a contest or diet. And when, you, when, you, when you apply that to any aspect outside the gym, you can surpass so many people. And I, I, it's, there's so much just besides the dieting and the training that you learn that you can take out and, and apply it to life. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. It, it, it's such a, I, I believe it's, it's a gift the, from what I did in bodybuilding, the, the driven attitude that I had in bodybuilding, that I was looking at every aspect of trying to, you know, what was I doing for recovery? What was I doing for diet? What was I doing for, to make my skin look great? You know, everything that I did, you know, I looked into it so fully. And when you're doing a business, you have different aspects of it, you know, how to run a profit and loss statement, you know, you know, product development, marketing, you have all these different aspects of business that you have to put all together to make a successful business. And you got to know about everything later on, you know, when you grow a business, you know, first you're the hustle, you're doing it all. Then you start hiring people, you get the right people that are experts in those certain categories in your business. So then you have a team and, but you still have to know what they're doing. If you don't know the job that they're doing, you may not be fully as good as what they're doing, but you're still able to know that they're not getting over on you. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you got it. It's that Jersey you gotta hustle, man. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Like I always tell people, I went to University of Belmont Avenue. You know what I mean? I already know what's yeah. going on with everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jersey has a different type of attitude. You know, I'm a proud Jersey guy. I mean, I you know I've been here, and not that I'm going to stay here forever because I want to go in some warm climate in Florida. But uh, it, Canada. It's, it, yeah, <laughs> Canada, right around Canada. <laughs> Too cold for me. But, you know, you know, you have to know. My family comes from Canada. We uh, oh, really? We uh, immigrated. My parents are from Italy. They immigrated to uh, Montreal. Okay. From Montreal. He got to Jersey. I don't know why he didn't go further south, but he got to Jersey, and this is where I'm. You know, today. Right. <laughs> you, you, same thing happened to my family as well. My mom's family went from Italy. Um, I think Avellino over to uh, like the Montreal area and then yep. went back, or Quebec. And then they went down to Jersey and I'm from the, I'm from Belleville. I'm from the Newark area. Oh, cool. Yeah. There was a, there's a lot, there's a big Italian community in Montreal. Yeah. There, know, is. That, there is. Yeah. yeah. So those are all immigrants from Italy. You know, they came to there. Yeah. You a, you a Jets fan by any chance? More Giants. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just ask you some, uh, some uh, quick question about off season because you said you were in shape in the off season. Uh, how, how much over your weight did you say? Like, were you just, uh, I have abs during off season. I'm in shape type. Or like, that's me. As long as I can see my abs, I know that I'm in pretty decent exactly. off season shape. Exactly. As long as I can see my abs. I mean, mm -hmm. you always have the lower back fat that you would have, but I always have abs. Right. I always had, you know, my legs that stayed pretty lean you know i i was you know as a pro bodybuilder i was doing exhibitions and seminars so i couldn't look like a fat slob so i stayed within within 20 pounds usually 10 pounds is water 10 pounds is fat right and there there's your there's your basically to get you know get in shape if i lose i can lose the water at that 10 pounds and i look almost like contest shape yeah, a lot of guys are, you know, bulking, bro. So they'll sit and just put on pounds and pounds. And then it was a cut season, you know, they got to do 30 weeks out instead of like, yeah, I, you know, I when did. I died down, it's just eight weeks of maybe four weeks of suffering. And then boom, I'm stage ready. Now, I moved people... to California. You know, it's funny. I moved to California to be a pro bodybuilder. I went to California. I was 256. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I met Lee Haney and, you know, I go to Lee Haney. I weigh more than you. I'm 256. You know, he was too. It was like 250. It goes, he goes, the difference between me and you is that you're fat. <laughs> that's what he goes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he was like, you know, I, I go, he's right. I'm fat. I can't be fat. You know, and I, I just started dieting away that, that fat and, you know, staying in shape. You know, the whole time, you know, you know, he says, you're an amateur. That's why you're fat. He goes, I'm a pro. <laughs> the difference. But, you know, I have to say, you know, Lee Haney taught me a lot because, you know, I moved to California. I was this, you know, 19-year-old kid that was just 
I, I was just driven to be a pro bodybuilder. And I was in, you know, my twenties or I was 20 years old, but I was really deep in training with him. And, you know, he just taught me how to, you know, control the weight, train as a bodybuilder. I was more of a power lifter. I mean, I've done some crazy weights. You know, I was a 525 bencher, 775 squatter. You know, I was, I was lifting some really heavy weights, you know, as a, as an amateur. And, um, I learned to just become more a bodybuilder, you know, and, and squeezing the weights and training the body to get myself to be more balanced. Mm -hmm. How long did you train with Haney? I trained with him over a year and a half. Okay. Right. Um, guys, got anything else? Um, only thing I got left to say, Rich, is, uh, you know, I want to uh, thank you for coming on, but, uh, my uh, girlfriend and I, uh, my girlfriend's competing at the New York Pro for her pro debut. She's a uh, women's physique. So we'll be actually be out in South Jersey if you're there in May. Uh, love to have a Midway steak sandwich with you, man. This is going to be her first time in Seaside. So I want her to get the, I want her to get the full experience. Oh, so it's, it's out here in, in, in uh, South Jersey? No, it's going to be in New York, but my mom is from uh, Lacey. She lives out of okay. Lacey. So we always, okay. every time we come back, I always go to Seaside. Cause, yeah, you know, yeah, give me a call. I'm, I'm, I live right near Seaside. All right, yeah, we we definitely gonna definitely gonna link up for uh, at least a workout and sandwich. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Nice. All right, Rich. Um, once again, thank you so much for coming on uh, the thank show. You. Let, let us let us pick your brain and talk about your company, guys. Um, go out try get uh, trial Super Pump. I know you've got some other good products. You've actually got a, a complete hydrolyzed whey, which I don't see. I really I also don't see any other companies that have a full complete hydrolyzed whey off the shelf. You can go buy at a store. Usually, you got to order that shit. So when yeah. I saw that, I grabbed one the other day to try it because I, I usually I know the isolates are good, but to find a complete hydrolyzed whey is very hard to find in just any supplement store. I need so, to find me a tub of that. Yeah, it's uh, called proven. It's whey. really hard right now with COVID, and there's a yeah. lot. Of, you know, there's a lot of issues with supply chain. Just to let you guys know, and right now it's very hard to get. You know hydrolyzed way <laughs> it's yeah. just like you know, i mean i'm i i brought now as, as you know i brought egg protein back to the market egg yeah. protein dead when i was competing egg protein was huge and i'm like why is egg protein not on the market Ah, oh, nobody thinks it's a good protein i'm like you know what i'm going to come up with egg protein i came up with proven egg right now it's one of my top selling proteins you know oh, proven yeah. egg. we drink it every morning yeah so I do, it's i do instead of doing nine eggs four whole eggs and a scoop of proven egg and there's your egg whites for the morning every day. And, uh, you know, and, and I had the naysayers. I always come up with ideas of like, why isn't anyone doing this? And maybe some people are not doing it because they're just not thinking about doing it. Mm -hmm. And yep. now, the past two years, it's been one of my top selling products is, you know, the egg protein, the hydrolyzed whey, um, you know, a product that's also been tried and true that hasn't changed is size on. I changed the look of the label that was still selling really well. That's one of the greatest intra workouts that we have. Anavite, Anavite is three products in one with you know two grams of carnitine, three point two grams of beta alanine, you know, high quality chelated minerals and vitamins. Uh, Anavite's my number one seller. If, if you know, if you guys didn't know that, it's one of my best selling products. But I have a lot of the tried and true older products, but a lot of newer products. You see, I came up with a lot more health driven products. You know, yep. green bread. I have yeah. proven joint. Collagen, my omega three fish oil is one of the best omega threes. It's high EPA, high DHA, not as much ALA. Enteric coating, so it bypasses the stomach, so you don't get um, fish burps. <clears throat> but I, you know, I just I think of you know <laughs> a certain category, and I try to make it the best. We came up with a vegan protein. We're definitely not a vegan brand, but if you look at our vegan protein, it's a really great vegan protein. It's all organic. You know, it's got hemp, pea, rice, um, total mat total amino acid ratio, you know, is is really good. Do you plan on doing any like sleep formulas? Because uh, I think that we just you came know up with cytoline. Cytoline is our is our sleep formula. Oh, it's it a is? fat burner. There's ingredients that, you know, it, if you use the product, you'll definitely feel that product to help. Which was sleep. it called? Cytoline? Cytoline. Cytoline, yep. yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that because I think it's, uh, for, it's yeah. mostly for recovery. You know, for the adrenal glands, and if mm -hmm. you're, you know, if your adrenal glands are good, you're going to be able to lose body fat more easily, and that's why we came up, you know, with Cytoline. It's uh, nighttime; people are liking it. They're sleeping very well. 
Um, we just came up with a liquid carnitine. I know there's a lot of companies have them, yeah, but I saw that. we have a three gram, you know, three gram per dose liquid carnitine. New flavors of super pump aggression because that product keeps growing. Um, so we keep reinventing myself. I I just came up because I'm in my 50s. I came up with uh, Gaspari Ageless. That's an anti aging brand. Um, you know, we have a heart health product. We have a nootropic, you know, brain booster. We have a natural testosterone booster. We have an anti-inflammatory. I just launched uh, a collagen bar. Um, and that and that is more towards the older demographic in their 40s. So it's just another, you know, like I feel <laughs> now I'm, I'm branching out to just do so much more than what I did just with Gaspari Nutrition. And like I told you earlier, I shouldn't, I couldn't lose my name. So mm -hmm. I'm able now to come up with different divisions of my using my name, you know, to grow what's the a, brand. What's the nootropic called? What's it's, it's, it's brain booster. Brain boost. Okay. Yeah. Brain booster. Yeah, Gaspari, just, look up Gaspari Ageless. Okay. Gaspari you sold, you sold me, time, you sold me on anti-aging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're in your 40s, you know, we, we just made a collagen bar. It's got 15 grams of peptide co of, of hydrolyzed collagen. Um, 10 grams of fiber made from real food. And, you know, it's funny. It's, that's another category I got into because I was like looking at it and I said, there's no collagen bars out there. There's collagen. There's, there's collagen. So we, you know, I brought that into the ageless line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I actually just bought the size. I, I was using the Glycofuse intro workout. Yeah. And then I started the size on this week <laughs> and I, I, I like it so far. It's pretty good. The pumps and stuff are ridiculous when I'm training. Yeah. It, so but this is only my first week on it, but, um, Rich, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, do you have anything else before we... Oh, it's an yeah. honor to talk to you and be with yeah. you on this podcast. Thank being you. In, thank being you. a person that's followed bodybuilding since I was a kid, it's a, when we heard you were coming on, I was really excited. So thank you cool. for coming on. And um, yeah, let, let me know, you know, when the show's out, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll promote it on my social media. Excellent. Right, we'll do. Thank, thank you, Rich. Right. Have Thanks, a good day, Rich. See, you, see you in Seaside, bro. Okay, bye-bye, guys. <laughs>